All right, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 1. Acts 1. Acts is the fifth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. And we are now three weeks into what is our 11-month journey through the book of Acts, from its beginning to its end. And the overarching title for this entire series is, You Will Be My Witnesses, which as we saw last week, is the non-negotiable mission for disciples of Jesus Christ, that we are to witness, to testify, to proclaim all that Jesus has now done to the world so that all the nations and all the families of the earth could be blessed by being saved from the penalty of their sin and brought back into relationship with God again through the accomplished work of Jesus, through his sinless life, death on the cross, and resurrection from the grave. Acts 1 verse 8 lays out both the mission for the church the mission for disciples of Jesus, and it provides the structure and framework for that entire book as it chases the geographical expansion of the church as the gospel is proclaimed and believed first in Jerusalem, then into the broader region of Judea, then into Samaria in the north, and then ultimately to the ends of the earth. As the book of Acts ends in chapter 28 with the apostle Paul finding himself all the way in Rome and yet able to proclaim the gospel freely there with without hindrance. And so because the book of Acts is structured in this way, we have set up our 11-month journey through Acts to mirror that structure. The first mini-series that we're in right now, which is a 12-part series, is entitled The Gospel in Jerusalem, which will take us through Acts chapter 6, at which point we'll see the gospel move out from Jerusalem and into Judea and Samaria. And the title of that mini-series will be the gospel in Judea and Samaria, because I don't have a creative bone in my body. Uh, and then we'll wrap the whole thing up right before Christmas as we see the gospel go to the ends of the earth. If you've missed the last two weeks, one of the things that we have to see clearly at the outset of this 11th month journey is that Luke, the beloved physician and companion of the apostle Paul, who indicates that he wrote Acts as the second part of his two-volume work, with the first part of that two-volume work being the Gospel of Luke, that Luke wrote Acts as historical narrative, the same genre as the four Gospels, as well as Genesis and Exodus and many other books in the Bible, meaning that we are meant to see and understand the things we see happening in the book of Acts as having actually happened in history, in real time and space. These aren't metaphors, the miracles that we see happen in Acts are not to be explained away as simplistic first century thinking. No, Luke the historian writes in great historical detail because he wants his readers to know and understand that the Christian faith, it's not based primarily on a philosophy or an ideology, but upon actual events that have happened in history, that our faith our morals and ethics, our ideas, our philosophies, they flow out of and depend upon the history of the person and work of Jesus Christ, his coming, his living, his dying, and his rising again. And so Luke investigated all of these things very carefully and then wrote with great historical detail and accuracy so that you and me and all who would read the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts would have great certainty concerning the things that we have and are being taught and so that you would have certainty for what you are now to be about for the rest of your life. And so now as we listen to the voice of God from the word of God, for what scripture says, God says, wherever you're at this morning, if you're able, I want to invite you to rise with me as we stand in attention to the voice of our God from his word. Acts 1, we'll read verses 12 to 26 this morning. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. 
With the reward he got from his wickedness, Judas bought a field where he had fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this. So they called the field in their language, Ah, Keldoma, that is field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go to where he belongs. Then they drew lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the 11 apostles. And this is God's holy and inspired word for us today. Let's pray together. Father, all scripture is breathed out by your Holy Spirit and is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness, that we may be equipped for every good work you have planned for us. So use your inspired word to equip us for that work this day. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake, and together we say, amen. Please be seated. The first 11 verses of Acts are packed with content. It took us two sermons just to get through those 11 verses. And as I said last week, there are at least three full sermons that could have been preached from verses 6 through 11 alone, as we hardly even focused on Jesus' ascension back to heaven. But now in verse 12, Jesus has left the scene. But before ascending, he gave to his disciples, the disciples in that day and the disciples of every day, the non-negotiable mission to be his witnesses. And this witnessing was to begin in Jerusalem, the very place that had the very people that rejected him, crucified him ultimately upon a cross to die. And yet Jesus' heart broke for this place. This was the place where many of the Jewish people lived. Many of the people who came from that physical lineage of Abraham, the covenant and chosen people that God started to draw to himself by his grace millennia before. When Jesus was traveling towards Jerusalem for the final days of his life, he lamented over the state of the spiritual deadness within them. As he said these words in Matthew 23, 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Jesus longed to see the people of Jerusalem, the ones who chanted crucify, crucify, changed and saved and redeemed by the power of the gospel. And so this was the place that the disciples were to begin as they sought to build his church and advance the kingdom of God in the world. But Jesus also told them in those first 11 verses that they were to wait A bunch of likely teenage or early 20-year-old men who were overflowing with confidence and testosterone, who had just witnessed the resurrected Christ over a period of 40 days, who had been given this mission to go out and change the world, they were told to wait. Go to Jerusalem and wait because what they needed to accomplish this mission and this work had not yet been given. Jesus told them to wait for the promise of the Father. As we saw back in verse 5, Jesus said, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The mission had been laid out and had been made clear. That they were to witness to all that Jesus had done so that his kingdom would grow and expand and come more fully to the earth as more and more people heard and believed the gospel as King Jesus took his seat upon the throne of more and more hearts and lives. 
who, so that not only were those people saved, but they begin to live as God has called us to live. So that God's design for how human flourishing happens on this earth would be experienced by more and more image bearers of God. But that whole mission was going to require them to be equipped with the Holy Spirit, who was going to be sent not many days from now. And so they were to wait and wait, they did. In many ways, the whole book of Acts, it's going to flesh out for us how Jesus fulfilled the very promise that he gave back in Matthew 16, when he told Peter these words, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church that first got planted in the Old Testament, When God first called Abraham into a covenant relationship with him, Jesus declared that he was going to continue to build that church, his church, his bride, and that nothing, not even hell or the attacks of the evil one, would be able to stop that from happening. And so everything that Jesus said before his ascension, and now all that we see happening in the 10 days between his ascension and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which we'll see next Sunday, is about Jesus continuing to build his church. And so what we wanna see in our text this morning is that because Jesus has promised to build his church, he will lead us into everything that we need for that to happen. And we'll develop that this morning by seeing first, the laying of the foundation, second, the apostolic office, and then third, a chosen replacement. And so first, let's see the laying of the foundation. As a father of four boys, three of whom are now teenagers, I can now look back on their lives and see how what was true of them very early on largely remains true of them today. That may be good news or bad news for parents of young children. Lisa and I often comment about how Aaron, when he was a little kid, he was always very self-sufficient, which as a fourth born, you probably have to be, right? Nobody's doing a lot for you at that point. And so we would often find him standing on the kitchen counters, having pulled a chair over to those counters so that he could climb up, open the cupboard door, get out a cup, and get his own glass of water. He didn't need any help. That was just the kind of kid that he was. And now as a 10-year-old boy, he largely remains self-sufficient today. That's been true of all of our boys. As we saw their personality begin to shine forth early on, What was true of them years ago largely remains true of them today. Well, what we see in the opening chapter of the book of Acts is a picture of the New Testament church in its infancy or its toddler phase. Very early in its life, in its existence, and yet the things that we see them doing, what was true of the early church early on remains largely true of the church today. There are differences, of course, as someone or something grows and develops. But what was true of the early church's personality at the core of its DNA remains intact for what true and healthy churches are all about today, even in the 21st century. And so let me show you five things that those disciples were doing as that foundation was being laid, as they waited for those 10 days for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. The first thing that marked the church was its obedience to King Jesus. The first thing that we read in verse 12 is this. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is in direct response to the command we saw Jesus give them back in verse 4. And while staying with them, Jesus ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait. And wait they did. And so what was true early on must remain true today, that the church receives its marching orders from our king as we seek to live in obedience to him. The second thing that marked the church was prayer. Verse 14 tells us this. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. I love this because Jesus had just told them everything that was about to happen. And they still devoted themselves to prayer. Sometimes people think 
You know, if God is sovereign, if God is in control of all things, if, if his will is going to happen, then what's the point in praying? That wasn't the early church's approach. They probably would have responded, if God's not sovereign, if God's not in control of all things, why would I bother to ask him anything? That first question, it misunderstands how God works in this world. God does what God wills to do. God's purposes always come to pass. And not even the sin or disobedience of human beings are going to frustrate his plans. But, sorry, I I just lost it. God does his work often through what we call secondary means. Meaning that God will use someone who goes and shares the gospel as the Holy Spirit is raising that dead heart back to life. God will use the generosity of someone to help meet that physical need of someone else. And God uses the prayers of his people to accomplish his purposes in this world. He doesn't need them. We aren't changing his mind or persuading him to do something that is counter to his will. But God uses the prayers of his people as the secondary means by which he accomplishes his purposes in this world. And our faith gets strengthened and it gets developed as we participate with God in his work. And so the church and its growth throughout the book of Acts, it was built upon prayer from the very beginning. And that must remain true of the church today because a church that prays is a humble church. It is a desperate church. And it is a church that expects that God is going to move in her midst. The third thing that marked the church was a united fellowship. Again, verse 14, all these with one accord, meaning they were united in fellowship, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his Brothers, And then verse 15 tells us that there were 120 disciples in total that were part of this earliest church. Because this has and always will be true of disciples of Jesus, that while we were justified before God on the basis of our own individual faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ, That while no person can be saved by the faith of another, when we are saved, we are saved into a body, into what Jesus calls his church. Because people need people. And if we want to grow in our faith, we must surround ourselves with others who will come alongside of us and sharpen us like iron sharpens iron. Sometimes people say things like, I don't need the church, I just need Jesus. But that's not true. That's not what Jesus taught. And when he promised that he would build his church, he wasn't talking about a building. He was talking about his disciples, his sheep, that he would be gathering together and bringing together to do life together, to live together in fellowship as a body where each member of that body depends upon and needs each other. The fourth thing that marked that church was the study of Scripture. Peter was clearly studying the Scriptures as he opened them and applied them to the situation that they found themselves in in that day. Now, we'll focus on Judas's absence from them in the second and third point. But Peter quotes from both Psalm 69 and Psalm 109 to show in verse 20 that all the things that had been happening had to have happened to fulfill what had been said beforehand through the Old Testament. And also notice how clearly Peter lays out the process of inspiration for how the Holy Scriptures had been written. As he said in verse 16, brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David. Yes, many of the Psalms were written by King David, but all scripture, including the Psalms, are inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that Peter declares that it was ultimately the Holy Spirit that was speaking through the mouth of King David. And so the church has and must always build itself upon God's inspired word, the scriptures, as we seek to understand them and then live in accordance with them. And then the fifth thing that marked the church was its recognition of its need 
for godly leadership. And for them in that day, it meant replacing Judas with someone who was going to fill that spot in the apostolic office. But the church must continually pray for and seek out godly leadership that would exalt Christ over themselves, that are willing to speak the truth regardless of the cost, and who repeat the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11.1 when he says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And so all five of those things were true of the church in its infancy as they waited for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. But these things must remain and must continually be true of Jesus' church today. For they are the foundations upon which God's kingdom will come and Jesus' church will be built. Second this morning, let's see the apostolic office. Now, it's really important for us, especially at the outset of this journey through Acts, to understand what the apostolic office is and what role it played in the early church. The first thing that we need to see is that the term disciple and apostle are not equivalent terms. A disciple is someone that is a student of another. Every Christian is a disciple of Jesus. And the goal of our discipleship is to become like the one we are disciples of. But an apostle is different than that. An apostle is someone who is sent with the authority of the one who is sending them to speak and act on their behalf. The chief apostle that we see in the New Testament is Jesus himself, as we saw last week in John 17, that he was sent to speak and act on behalf of the Father. And so Jesus takes his 11 disciples, grants him his authority, and appoints them to be his apostles. Not every disciple is an apostle, but every apostle was and is a disciple of Jesus, as they are given the authority of Jesus to act and speak on his behalf. Now, there were three qualifications for someone to be an apostle that we see laid out clearly in our text this morning, as the apostles seek a replacement for Judas. The first qualification for an apostle is that they had to have been a disciple of Jesus for the entirety of his earthly ministry. For how could you act and speak on behalf of someone else if you were not privy to all that they had said and done? And so as Peter is laying out the process for choosing Judas' replacement, he says this in verse 21. He says, so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that Jesus went in and out among us beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up. And so that was the first criteria. The second qualification for an apostle is that they had to have been an eyewitness of Jesus' resurrection. This is how verse 22 ends. One of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And then the third qualification for an apostle is that they had to be chosen and commissioned directly by Jesus himself, the one who was granting them his authority. Now, the one exception that we see to this is the apostle Paul, whose conversion story we're going to see three different times throughout the book of Acts, but he wasn't part of that original 12, and yet he did receive a direct call and commission from Jesus on that Damascus road, and so was there a witness to the resurrected Christ, and then he spent significant time with these apostles to ensure that the gospel he had been given is the same one that they were teaching. And so these apostles are the men that either wrote or were directly connected to those who wrote the scriptures. Matthew, Mark, who was deeply connected to Peter, Luke, who was deeply connected to Paul, John, the apostle Peter, the apostle Paul, who wrote the most letters in the New Testament, because they had the authority to teach and to write the very word of God. So that when Paul is describing the church in Ephesians 2, he writes these words in verse 19. He's talking to church members there. He says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone 
in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And so Jesus' church is built upon the apostles' teaching in the New Testament and the prophets' teaching in the Old Testament, the full word of God. And by the time we got to the end of the first century, as most of these apostles had died off, so was that apostolic office. For no others would be able to meet those criteria, and the word of God had now been written down, recorded, and closed. And so though some claim to be today, there are no apostles. For now we speak on behalf of and with the authority of God as we proclaim all that God has already revealed to us through those apostles in his written word. And so finally this morning, let's see a chosen replacement. This text, along with Matthew 27, tells us of how Judas, that disciple who had betrayed Jesus, ended his own life. We saw earlier that Peter understood both Psalm 69 and Psalm 109 to foretell of Judas's destruction, but also of the need to replace him and to fill that 12th spot in the apostolic office. Now, one cool thing to notice in this section is that there were 120 men, women, and children that were gathered together as part of this earliest expression of the church. And yet only 11 of these people were part of that apostolic office. Which means that for the other 109, simply being part of Jesus' people, simply having Jesus in their life was for them enough. They didn't need a position of leadership or power or authority to give their life to this mission. They wanted Jesus, and for them, that was enough. But Peter calls the church here to find Judas' replacement from the other 109 people and to bring that number of apostles back to 12, which I believe shows the strong connection between the Old Testament church of Israel that was comprised of 12 tribes, and the New Testament church that was built on the 12 apostles. The Old Testament and the New Testament, they are deeply connected together as one story. The Old Testament being the gospel promised and the New Testament being the gospel realized or fulfilled. And as Galatians 3, 7 tells us, know then that it is those of faith meaning those who have put faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is those who are the sons of Abraham. Meaning you might not have a drop of Jewish blood in your veins, but if you are a disciple of Jesus by faith, then you are part of that offspring. You are part of that lineage, spiritual lineage of Abraham part of the same people that God started to gather together all the way back in Genesis 12, the one church of God. And so Peter saw the need for a 12th apostle, and after laying out those qualifications that we looked at earlier, used the discernment of the apostles to put forward two men that met those qualifications, Joseph and Matthias. And because they understood that an apostle had to be directly called and commissioned by Jesus himself, they used a common Old Testament practice called casting lots to determine which of these two men would be chosen by Jesus. And so they prayed in verse 24, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. This process of casting lots to determine the Lord's will, both in the Old Testament and here in Acts 1, was rooted in a deep belief and trust in the providence and sovereignty of God over all things. It wasn't just an excuse to turn off their brains. They still sorted through the 109 people and narrowed it down to two but then prayed that God would reveal which one he desired to serve. And though we ought not simply roll dice to determine the Lord's will for us as we go throughout our lives, one of the things we can take away from this whole scene 
is an understanding that while we are, yes, absolutely to use our brains and search the scriptures to what God has made clear to us and, and seek out and use godly counsel from our brothers and sisters in Christ to determine the Lord's will, we must also have a deep trust in the sovereignty and providence of God over our lives. That while we make our plans, ultimately the Lord is going to direct our steps. And so here God chooses a replacement for Judas, the apostle Matthias, who would join with the other 11 apostles to lead out in the mission that Jesus had given to them. Because Jesus is going to build his church. He promised to do so. And so he will provide everything necessary for that to happen. And this picture that we see of the early church, friends, it must remain a reflection of the church today. An obedient, unified, praying, scripture-searching people who submit ourselves in all ways to the apostolic authority that has been given and sealed for us in God's word. For that is how Jesus has and will continue to build his church. Let's pray together. Father, your son told us that he would build his church. And what a humble privilege it is to be part of that mission. First of all, as those who have been called and saved unto new life by the accomplished work of Jesus, but then also called to go out and to be witnesses of him to the world, thank you for giving us what we need the Holy Spirit, to do that work. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Let's respond trusting.